Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. We uh, have cause to celebrate uh, with David and Jan. Um, their newest grandchild, Micah Allen, arrived uh, roughly in the last hour or so. So we rejoice with them. We have much to be thankful for. Make sure you encourage them with that. As I look out at your faces, I have cause to give thanks for each one of you in my heart. Uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So this evening, as we worship together, look around you. Um, look at your brothers and sisters seated in the pews with you, and find cause to encourage them. Tell them why you're thankful for them, that they're here with you this evening. Would you please rise to receive the call to worship? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing knowing that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. Grace and peace and mercy be multiplied to you in the name of God and of Christ Jesus our Lord. We open by singing hymn number 604, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. You have taken us, each from our own families, each from our own place, our cities, our towns, our homes. You have called us out of isolation, Father, and have knit us together as a body, as a family here, as the church of God, with you as our Father, our King, our Head over all. And so we give you thanks, Father, for that great work of salvation that you have worked through Jesus Christ, our eldest brother. And also, Father, for bringing us together to give us a family in addition to the earthly family. A family that's not bound by circumstance and proximity only, but that wherever we might go, wherever you might call us, we still have that unity of spirit. And so even as we sing your praises tonight, help us to be especially mindful that we are in it together. That we sing not as individuals, not as the sum total of our number, but even beyond what we are as the numbers add up, even what we are through your Spirit, one people, one new man together, as Ephesians tells us. And so we thank you, Father, for calling us out of darkness to live in your marvelous light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing of our great Redeemer. Hymn number 650, I will sing of my Redeemer.
We turn now to the book of 2 Peter and the third chapter as we look to God's word for instruction for our daily lives. This is the word of the Lord. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other Scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. What wonderful words of reminder that what we see before us all the things we have in this life will be dissolved away, and yet we await better things in the life to come. Uh, often we forget that. We become so fascinated what, with what's in front of us. So I invite you now to join me as we confess that sin to the Lord. Father, some of us have shorter, but many of us will have 70, maybe 80 years in this life, and because we think in such temporary ways, we can subtly, Lord, become convinced that this is all there is. That what we see with our eyes and touch with our hands is the best that is to be offered to us from You. And because we forget, Father, or because we are so short-sighted, oftentimes we begin to act in certain ways. We begin to chase after the possessions of of this life as though they could truly satisfy the longings and desires of our hearts. That if we could just earn enough income, get our children into the best school so that they might earn the best income, and that we would have enough time with them in this life that truly we would be satisfied. And yet, Father, in Your providence and in Your kindness to us, You give us those things sometimes and show us that they don't satisfy Or in other ways, you take them away from us and then show up and show us that you and you alone can satisfy. What a kindness it is, Father. But we pray that you would forgive us for those seasons where in our fickleness we do wander. Where we chase after those things. Where we become lax in our Christian walk, in our pursuit of you as our chief treasure. Help us, Father, to be diligent, to be hard workers, to be zealous for good deeds and for righteousness. Knowing that it's there that as we trust and obey King Jesus, that we are much more blessed despite whatever material things we might lack in this life. Help us, Father. Help us to be careful that we wouldn't be taken away That we wouldn't be carried away by lawless people, by those who might say God cares little for righteousness because He's paid your debt for you. Help us to take the law seriously, not as a way to earn our salvation, but as a way to show our gratitude and to deepen our enjoyment of Christ. We pray these things in His name. Amen. We are a fickle people often, but God proves himself faithful, though every man were faithless. Receive these words from Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That is good news, that God cleanses us, that He is restoring us and sanctifying us, even as Pastor Dave told us this morning. Let us respond by inviting each other, but also in that act by coming ourselves to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. As we sing Psalter Hymnal 439, Come ye sinners, poor and needy. Would you please stand to sing.
seated. If you are in that place where perhaps there's a habitual sin that has power in your life or seems to have control over you, that's the invitation. Arise, go to Jesus. There's life and joy there. We do that now corporately as we make our request known to Him. So I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Father, you, you have given us loved ones that fill our lives and our hearts with joy. Maybe it's our children who when we hear their voices, we hear their laughter, Father, we, we rejoice. Our, our hearts overflow as we see them toddle around. They burst with pleasure and delight. How much more, Father, should our hearts beam with radiant joy and consolation at the thought of You, even as we have just sung. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. We are so thankful, Father, for the immediacy of Your presence through Your Holy Spirit that there's no height to which we could climb, no depth to which we could fall where You're robbed, or where we are robbed, rather, of Your presence, where You will not seek us out and find us. What comfort there is in knowing that. Thank You for such a kindness to us, for You are the God who is here with us. Lord, how cruel it is when we take for granted those who bring us so much joy. How cruel when we take our spouse for granted and treat them with indifference. Yet, Father, that's exactly what we do with Your Spirit oftentimes. We trample underfoot the blood of Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit, much like we might trample over road salts or grass clippings. Your Spirit would be right to be outraged and to grieve at the way we sometimes take it for granted, but help us, Father, to savor that presence, to, to draw near to You every single day, Father, to make that our chief business every single day, to have some measure of knowledge of You, some acquaintance with Your Word, with Your promises, with Your law, with Your Gospel, with the revealed will of God for our salvation, that every single day that would be the first thing we think about when our eyes open to run to King Jesus for comfort, for solace, for strength, for wisdom, for all that He is to us, Father. We thank You for the young people in our church. We take much delight in them. We pray, Father, that as we think about the years ahead for Your church, we, we don't know where things are going. It's part of Your secret will. We sometimes think we know where culture is headed, but Father, You could do amazing things. And nevertheless, we pray that You would be raising up, even in our midst, great men and women of God who would be courageous in every circumstance, even without the promise of success, that they would set their faces like flint to follow Jesus, to make Him their King and treasure, to do whatever He says regardless of the cost. We pray for us as those who may be their senior in age, Father, that we would have such courage that we might set them that example and that we would lay upon them the mantle of the church to honor their God, to proclaim His glory to the nations whether their neighbor 50 feet from their front door or that person in Africa who's never heard that name, that You would be raising up even missionaries, Father, who would count their lives cheaply for the sake of the Gospel. Being free, Lord, that they might even die for the sake of the Gospel, for the sake of the nations to hear that good news. And Lord, we thank You for the way in which You are blessing that work even in our midst as our numbers have grown here, Father. But we, we think of GEMS, a, a ministry that provides activities. We thank You for the leaders there and for the many girls outside of our congregation from our neighborhood who come to that and have the love of Christ shown to them by Your daughters, by older women who are investing in them. That can make all the difference in someone's life, Lord. Even this week, I was able to hear from a, an older gentleman who said it was because someone took an interest in a summer camp to share the Gospel with him that he became a believer and it changed the entire course of his life. So we thank You, Father, for ministries like Gems and we pray that You would see 
fit to bless it, Lord. We thank You for our Sunday school teachers. We think of those in the past of uh, Rich Clarabout, a Ron Gensema, a Helen Veldhorst. There, there are many others even here, Lord, who have labored for many years and they might not be laboring now, but they've touched so many lives, Father. And so we thank You for those who continue that legacy now, the way that our children have a deep affection for them, a trust for them, that as they teach them the things of God, that they look at them with love and trust and know that they are being taught well, that they are being guided and shepherded to follow You. What a gift it is, Father. We pray that You'd be with those in our congregation who have various cares and concerns and anxieties. We think of Emily Logren and, and for her job transition, Father, even as she interns and looks forward to uh, perhaps a full-time position, we pray that You would give uh, her favor in the eyes of her employers, Lord. We think of Tally Scott and her upcoming surgery, Father. We pray that You would be with her in that process, that You might comfort her, that she would feel a really deep sense of Your presence throughout that process. We thank You for the way in which You've been at work in answering our prayers. For those who are ill, we think of Linda Vaness and how her surgery has been successful in many ways, Father. That they were able to remove some of the things that were at war with her body. We pray that You might heal the infection that has taken place and also, Father, for the upcoming scans and, and the things that remain to be done medically, Lord. We think of Glenn Gruitt and ask for your strength in his ongoing chemo treatments. And we think of others who have recently had surgeries like Linda Rathel and uh, Jerry Urban. Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Father, we pray that you would continue to give us unity. That's a spiritual work that we have through your spirit as we read your word. And we, we pray that it would continue. We don't take it for granted. Not every church has that. And we don't always have it, Lord. So we thank You for the sweet gift that it is. And we pray that it might continue. We pray that for our committees, that as they do their work, and perhaps as with the vaccine, the lockdowns begin to ease and, and things begin to lighten and we begin to take up more work again, Lord, as ministries, we pray that You would help us to have a very clear sense of our work as separate committees, but also a very clear sense of how we all make contributions to the overall health and good of our church. We think especially, Lord, of face-to-face -face in our women's ministry as well. Lord, we, we pray, Father, that You would be developing those relationships between our women, that the mothers in the faith would be mentoring the daughters in the faith, and that You would help those connections to deepen and to multiply in number, that You would help, Father, the older women to identify who they want to invest in and the younger women to identify who they want investing in them and to seek it out to be so bold. Lord, we thank You for the spiritual fathers You've given us in this congregation. Even as I've counted, Lord, some congregations have maybe one or two elders and You've given us 38 men right now with us who have been ordained to that office. Men for whom, who will have to give an account, Lord, to whom we look and to whom we are cared for, by whom we are cared for, Lord. And so we just thank You for that good gift that You've given to us in those men. We think especially of Pastor Dave. Your Word says the, that one who rules justly over men that He dawns like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like the rain that makes grass to sprout. I thank You, Father, for the privilege of an upfront seat to watch this dear brother work and to invest in others and to watch, Father, that ministry happen where the sun and the rain makes people grow that through this man You do that in young ministers and in people who don't even yet know the Lord and people who've been walking with the Lord for a while, Father, each of them seems to be so deeply blessed by His ministry. And so we thank You for Him. And we pray that You would continue to strengthen our officers who care for our souls. Lord, we thank You for the ministers and officers and other churches. We think of Clint Eberspacher, minister over in Hingham, at Hingham Church. We thank You for the growing friendship that Pastor Dave and I have with him. And we pray, Father, that You would bless his leadership. 
that you would help him to continue to mature in his confidence and in his leadership abilities there, Father. Lord, we pray for those who may have cooled in their relationship with you. We all go through seasons which ebb and flow, and yet, Father, we pray that we might be the means by which they are sought out and brought back, that they are shown that You care for them. That You are that great shepherd of the sheep who goes after the lost and wandering sheep who leaves the 99 to go. May we have such a character built in us as we reflect King Jesus as by virtue of our union with Him, we become more and more like Him. We thank You, Father. You are that great shepherd. And as You shepherd us now, we pray that You would see fit to hear these requests. We draw near to You because we love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to hear the story of the rich young ruler, we are confronted with the idea of idolatry and of worship in that story. There is a a very short parable there, but as we prepare to do that, we're going to confess our faith together from Westminster Shorter Catechism, number 48 and 49. So, dear congregation... What are we specially taught by these words before me in the first commandment? These words before me in the first commandment teach us that God, perceiving all things, taketh notice of and is much displeased with the sin of having any other God. Which is the second commandment? The second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. That's a good commandment to think about and reflect on. We don't often have figurines, but we struggle indeed to keep idols away from our hearts. In 2017, Time Magazine ran with an obituary for a small Albanian woman named Agnes Bojashu. I know I'm butchering that. Uh, But in that obituary, the magazine's editors noted that the cause of death was heart failure. And one reader responded to the editors with a letter saying, this woman's heart did not fail, but she had finally succeeded giving all her heart away. Now you might wonder why a magazine as prominent as Time Magazine would cover some obscure person like Agnes Bojaju. Well, this woman wasn't obscure. We all know her by the name Mother Teresa. For almost 40 years, Mother Teresa was famous since about the 60s, She gained notoriety and fame for her service to the poor in Calcutta. She adopted the name Teresa when she joined the Sisters of Laredo monastic group at the age of 18. And since the age of 18 until she was 87, she was in India caring for the poor. And she was caring for those who were dying of hunger and disease. And the way she would care for them is she would beg for provisions on the street, and then whatever she had that she didn't need for her own survival, she would give to them to clean their wounds and to make them as comfortable as she could. Her main area of service was to stay outside of a Hindu temple where many were abandoned to die, for in that religion, pain is supposedly an illusion. Now, it's almost impossible, if you know the story of Mother Teresa, to hear about her life and to not be impressed. And even in those moments, it's wise to take inventory. How far do we fall short of such a great person? But one wonders, are all Christians required to live in that kind of poverty? As a member of a monastic order, Mother Teresa had taken certain vows. Vows of poverty, of chastity, and of obedience. How do such vows relate to our rather ordinary Christian lives? These are the kinds of questions that come up when we think about the story of the rich young ruler. This man seems to have been respectable, moral, diligent even, pursuing holiness. He had made a rather good run of it, yet Jesus says to him, one thing you lack. 
one thing you lack. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And those words have haunted many. They've haunted because the young man's question to Jesus is what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? And then Jesus says, sell all that you have. So Jesus seems to be saying that we must sell all that we have in order to inherit eternal life. More than anything, as we read this text, I want to clarify what Jesus meant when He said those words. Does, does He in fact mean that we must all live like Mother Teresa? Must I be Mother Teresa in order to go to heaven? Those are the kinds of questions I hope to answer, but we need God's help. So would you join me in prayer? Father, few texts have been so easily misunderstood because they are claim what seems to be too much. They seem to confuse us by how Jesus, you responded to this man. And so I pray that despite the fact that this man went away not understanding what was being said to him, that you would spare us that. That through your Holy Spirit, you might illumine the eyes of our hearts that we would truly see what Jesus was doing. In fact, how deeply he was loving this man in what he said to him. Help us, Father, to understand and help me as your servant to be clear. Take me up and use me in demonstration of your spirit and your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 18, beginning in verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God and who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. In the earliest days of Christianity, hardship was not hard to come by. Most Christians lived in the fear of death for their faith, but by the year about 230, most of that had changed. The emperor converted to Christianity, and almost overnight, it seemed like the church had considerable social influence and power, and along with that eventually came wealth. That raised a question for the early church. Did Christianity's authority rest on it being a suppressed religion, on it being poor and downtrodden and downcast? Did Christianity, in fact, need to be persecuted to survive? Now that seems like an odd question, but it was one that they had to wrestle with as they went through this change. And one of the answers that was given to that was to found monasteries, much like the one Mother Teresa participated in, or monastic orders. And behind this belief was the idea that Christianity needed superhero-like examples of suffering and service to have the authority to advance in the world. They needed these superheroes who could sort of set the bar for them and speak to their moral quality. And so, behind this, developed the idea that's been called the doctrine of the double Christian life. Not that one person had two Christian lives, but that there were two classes of Christians. That those who live the ordinary life of working for a living, of raising a family, and were actively engaged in their neighborhood or society, that those Christians were inherently inferior to a subset of elite Christians. That those who, like Mother Teresa, took vows of poverty, of chastity and obedience, 
that they took on that burden and had a specific responsibility. Now, I think, even for us as Protestants, we, we sort of think that way sometimes. We're, we're tempted to think that way. And, and here's why I believe we do. How many of us would feel more spiritual if we devoted ourselves to full-time Christian ministry instead of working at the bank or something like that? Or how many of us assume that those who work in those roles must be more spiritually mature than the rest of us? We sort of operate that way functionally. But I think that way of understanding the Christian life, that you have sort of ordinary Christian and then you have these superhero Christians that really take Jesus seriously, misunderstands this passage in two key ways. First, it disconnects the ruler's question from the answer that Jesus gives. I mentioned it already. The man is asking Jesus about the requirements for salvation. How do I obtain or inherit eternal life? And everything Jesus says to him from that point forward is an answer to that initial question. The second misunderstanding is that that sort of reading of this passage doesn't universalize What Jesus says in verse 23, in other words, it doesn't understand it as applying to all Christians. It says it just applies to this certain subset, maybe like this rich ruler, that he needed to go above and beyond. And those two errors are destructive. I want to argue against both of those. I want to convince you this evening that Jesus is commanding something that is required of every Christian. And I've already said the first reason why I think that. He's answering the man's question about eternal life. How do I inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? That's what the ruler is asking. But then notice that Jesus follows that up by saying how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the man goes away, he's saying he did not enter the kingdom of God. He was not saved because he was not willing to do this. And then the second reason I think that this applies to all Christians is because those who heard it who were standing there in verse 26, they ask, he can't be saved? Who then can be saved? Jesus? If this man, this rich ruler of the synagogue, can't be saved, what about us? And then third, in Peter's answer, his confident assertion, Jesus again, if you look at verse 30, points to eternal life who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So those are three reasons why I believe Jesus' answer is something relevant for all Christians. But I also said that His command in verse 22, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, that that is a specific command. That Jesus is telling us to do that. This man's sense of self-righteousness is what's at stake in this passage. That's key for us to understand. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much about him other than that he's a ruler. Now, that term doesn't mean that he's a king or a governor, but it meant that he was the ruler of the synagogue. It was his job in the synagogue to understand the law, to apply it to others. So what that means about him is that he was known for a concern for righteousness, for keeping the commandments of Moses. And he was also recognized for his ability to do that. He seemed to be more righteous than the rest of the people around him. He would have been the moral ideal of his day. And he thinks that about himself. I have kept all these commandments from my youth. Now, Jesus begins to dismantle this guy's self-perception, his understanding of himself. But before we go there, I want you to see the connection between a few things. You see, this guy had confused something in his head. He was mistaking wealth, success, and respectability for the righteousness that God requires. And this isn't something that I'm reading into the text. Notice verse 19 with me just one moment where he calls Jesus good teacher and Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. See, Jesus is pressing him here. What is your standard of goodness, ruler? Why are you calling me good? He's, Jesus isn't denying his divinity here, but he's loving this man. He's pressing him. And so then Jesus tells him all of the commandments of God. He says, you know the commandments. He's pressing him. Are you really good? 
And then the man doesn't get the point because he says, I've kept all of these. I'm doing all right. Okay. So then Jesus follows up. And Mark's Gospel, Luke doesn't tell us this, but Mark's Gospel tells us that when Jesus heard that response, He loved the man. He loved him. And that's why He gives him this follow-up commandment. I remember watching an old sports movie. I don't even remember what movie it was, but in, in that movie, there's a quarterback who gets injured in the, the game before the big game. And he suffers uh, an injury to his shoulder. And he really wants to play in the championship. So he goes into his coach's office and says, Coach, I'm, I'm healed. I, I can play. And the coach sort of understands what he's doing. And so the coach grabs something off of his desk and he throws it to the quarterback who tries to reach for it to catch it and then winces in pain. And the coach tells him, you, you can't play. You're going to hurt yourself by doing that. Jesus is doing something like that. He's giving him this command to reveal what's in his heart. Go sell all that you possess. So as I'm saying that this command applies to every Christian, what I mean is that Jesus is giving this man a certain command to show us that he doesn't understand the kingdom. He doesn't understand how to enter the kingdom. And I think Jesus' command to us is basically sell all that you have, but not in the literal, physical sense. And I think that for two reasons why Jesus might be after something a little bit different than actually sell all of your stuff, like have a garage sale tomorrow. And I think this because if you look at Jesus' response to Peter, we begin to see what Jesus is after here with this young man. First, notice that Jesus talks about being paid back in this life. When He responds to Peter, when Peter says, see, we've, we've left our homes and followed you, Jesus. Jesus begins to tell him about being paid back. No one has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more. Now, right there, we expect Him to say in the life to come. But He says, in this time, in this life, now, You get paid back for those things. Now I hate to tell you as much as we might hope for it, he mentions houses here, but this isn't a promise that we all get a cottage in northern Wisconsin in payment for leaving something behind. Some of us might be tempted to think that. I think Jesus is after something else here. And the other clue that tells us that Jesus doesn't literally mean sell all that you have is in Mark's Gospel in this same section Jesus adds a little phrase, or Mark reports a phrase that Luke doesn't, and it's the phrase, with persecutions. That persecutions is part of the promise that pays us back, that should help us to see that there's something more valuable there for us. That there's something operating in persecution and hardship that enables us to experience a foretaste of eternal life in this life, in this time. So that tells us that Jesus isn't just talking about stuff here. He's not just talking about possessions. So if you walk away from this passage thinking, I'm going to get paid back. If I give $100, I'll get $1,000 in heaven. You're on the wrong track. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. So there's not two classes of Christians. There's one class of Christians and Jesus is pressing us to see something really important. But now we begin to talk about the dangers of riches. Jesus talks about that. How hard it is for those who are rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's disclosing his heart, this challenge. And two things rise to the surface from this man's heart. Pride, I think, and sadness. We we touched on pride just a little bit, but I want to focus on that sadness. We're told that he was sad because he was extremely rich. In other words, for this man, he considered his possessions as of greater value than what Jesus had to offer. So that's the simple command of Jesus. Go sell all that you have means to consider the kingdom of God as more valuable than anything in your life. That's the command that applies to all of us. That we must count Christ as more valuable than our children, than our wife, than our mother, our father, our home, our job, whatever it is, Jesus is more important. 
he is more valuable. Now, some of us might consider ourselves rich. We might actually consider ourselves very, very wealthy, but this passage is a challenge for rich and poor alike. That is the nature, again, of Jesus' response to Peter. Think about Peter's comment to him again. See, Jesus, I've left. I've left these things for you. He's beginning to address Peter's heart and say, don't consider yourself poor just because you don't have those things. See, if you consider yourself poor because you don't have enough stuff, you're not yet understanding the kingdom of God. Luke 6.20, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. The surefire sign that something is more important to you than God is that you feel sad about giving it up for the kingdom. That you feel sad about the prospect that Christ would call you to give something up in order to have more of Him. And that's why Jesus is addressing Peter that way. It won't do to give it up and to feel like you've lost out. To be grumpy and sullen and sad about it. You must be overflowing with joy as though you just hit the lottery, even as you give up the things that matter most to you. That's what Jesus is saying to both Peter and to the rich young ruler. Are you starting to feel why the people respond to Him by saying, who then can be saved? Who can have this kind of affection for the Lord? So what can you do? What can you do? Well, in a moment, I want to talk about the necessity and empowerment of God's miraculous work. But first, I do want to talk about the importance of self-denial in the Christian life. It really is harder for those who are wealthy and rich to enter the kingdom of God. And it's hard because God's good gifts easily become substitutes and consolation prizes for the enjoyment and treasuring of God. It's easier to have little longing for God when there are more things to distract yourself with. This should be chilling for us because there has never been a generation of people who have more of those than we do. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.9, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Calvin said this, Many are so delighted with marble, gold, and pictures that they become marble-hearted. The kitchen with its savory smells so engrosses them that they have no spiritual savor. So God has given us a work by which we fortify our souls, and that's the work of self-denial, where we deny ourselves pleasures that we've otherwise earned, that otherwise are accessible to us, For the sake of saying to ourselves and to God and to the idol that God is our chief treasure, that we are more dependent on Him than whatever else in life. The undeniable wisdom in the life of someone like Mother Teresa is that indulging the flesh can make us spiritually stupefied or callous. In talking about fasting, Pastor John Piper said this, half of Christian fasting is that our physical appetite is lost because our homesickness for God is so intense. The other half is that our homesickness for God is threatened by our physical appetites because our physical appetites are so intense. In the first, we yield to the higher hunger that is. In the second, we fight for the higher hunger that isn't. In other words, when we deny ourselves, when we fast, when we give up food or something else for a time, We are fighting with our hearts, with that part of us that is so drawn to those other things to say, no, I want to be more hungry for God than for that. I'm going to gird up my soul for that. In other words, fasting helps us to say with Paul, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. I discipline my body. I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Pastor Dave did a wonderful job this morning saying that things in this life are going to make you promises. They're going to say, I'll make you content. I'll make you happy. I'll make you satisfy. I'll take your sadness away. And fasting is one way that we say, no, that's a lie. It won't. It'll leave me hungry for more. But only God will satisfy. So sell all that you have? You bet. You bet that's what God commands. 
give it up. Think of the things most dear to you. The things you most regularly comfort yourself with that you most regularly depend on and find ways to go without them. Find ways to give them up. To say that Jesus is the higher hunger. He is the greater treasure. Now start small. Don't try to go 40 days all at once or go a year all at once. Start small, but aim high. If it's food, skip a meal to pray. If it's television, skip out on your favorite TV show. Give up those things which would entangle you. As you think about this, think about it in these terms. When you lift weights, you're trying to increase your maximum. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get strong enough so that you can lift the heaviest amount of weight just one time. That's not fasting. That's not how you go about fasting. You don't just try to do it once, but it's a lot more like distance running. Distance running, you don't just try to do something once, but you're doing it constantly. You're constantly training, constantly disciplining your body so that you wouldn't be dominated, but that you improve and you grow and you grow. Fasting then, self-denial is part of a lifelong work. It's part of basic Christian work that you would draw near to Christ. But then lastly, I want to highlight for you the insufficiency of fasting. It is an important work. It's a necessary work. But if that's our ultimate dependence, if that's what we fall back on, then we've missed something really important here. Doesn't fasting seem incredibly flimsy against the pleasures of this world, against the allure of this world? If we depend on fasting, if we stop with fasting as the answer to who can be saved, then we might start for a while, but we're going to give up. We're going to fail. We're going to become disillusioned because we're going to say, I'm fasting, and it just doesn't seem to be completely satisfying. See, in his conversation with the rich ruler, Jesus is addressing pride. We talked about sadness, but now let's talk about pride because as he addresses his pride, he's addressing our pride as well. This is why I wanted to talk about Mother Teresa tonight. I seriously doubt that any of us will ever practice or achieve the level of self-denial that she practiced. But there's a way in which that kind of poverty can truly become a richness, a pride-inducing thing in our lives. And, And here's how I see that connection working out. First, the reason riches are so dangerous is that they lead to self-confidence or self-assurance. 1 Timothy 6.17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Revelation 3.17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. See, riches aren't dangerous because they're bad in themselves, but they begin to make us think we don't need anything, that we're self-sufficient, that we're satisfied. And so Jesus is warning the rich man because he wants him to see his poverty for what it is. But then there's a second step. Pride causes self-reliant religion. Self-reliant religion is any attempt to seek eternal life by trying to work for your righteousness, to try to work for your standing before God. So any notion that fasting or vows of poverty will bring you into the kingdom of God, that's that's self-reliant religion. And notice how subtle and subversive our hearts are. They take a commandment of God and they produce the opposite. So poverty, instead of producing a sense of dependence on the Lord, our poverty, our fasting, might become the instrument by which we justify ourselves. By which we say to God, like Peter did, I'm not like the rich ruler. I gave it up, Lord. I gave it up for you. I'm earning my salvation by giving things up do you, do you see the shift? But it's pride at root. It's pride at base. So I, I don't know this about Mother Teresa, but if she thought her works would save her, she's just as much a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. She's just as much a camel trying to go through the eye of the needle. Notice what Jesus says. It's impossible with man. It's impossible with man to have this kind of love for the kingdom, this kind of treasure for the kingdom. You can't do it all on your own. But he doesn't stop there. 
He says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. That, friends, is the paradox of the Gospel. For those who are seeking the Lord, that you must not hope in the thing itself. You must not hope in your fasting, in your self-denial, but you must rather hope in the God who promises to work through it. Do you see that? Do you see that? The good news is that you're worse than you think, but that God is more gracious than you could imagine. So yes, fasting is flimsy. If you partake of it in a self-righteous mindset, it won't produce the fruit. It can't on its own, but God has promised. God has promised to work through it. Not because you deserve it, but because He's gracious and loving. So here's how this looks practically. If you're going to fast in reliance on God, it, it should look something like this. God, I'm, I'm trying to go 40 days without television. I know how often I allow the sinful programming and the distraction of television to convin convince me that my restlessness is satisfied. That I just need more time to relax. But I know that at the end of that, I'm still left hungry. That I'm never filled up. I'm never satisfied. Lord, guard me from thinking this act of obedience ensures or causes my salvation. Guard me too, Lord, from the thought that I ever stop needing You. Still, I know that You have promised to accomplish what is impossible for me. So in dependence on Your promise and despairing of myself, I'm going to walk in obedience, knowing that it's Your grace that will bless me through it. That's how we fast. That's the blessing of any of the means of grace, whether it's fasting, self-denial, or the Word. It's that there's a power active through the means of grace that doesn't belong to them and themselves. That's the promise of God to work through our flimsy obedience to save our souls. Not because we deserve it. Not because we force His hand. But because we serve a God who loves us and is gracious to us. So that's the invitation of this passage. Jesus says, come, follow me. I'm gracious. With what's impossible with you is possible with me. And I'll pay you back a thousandfold of anything that I ask. Let us pray. Father, even as we hear those words, what is impossible with man is possible through God. What I have hoped to accomplish in this sermon is impossible with me, with us. And yet, O oh Lord, is possible with You. So Father, help us to see that we are not poor. For blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Help us to see how rich we are in Jesus. In His name we pray. Amen. Jesus calls us to follow Him because He's a treasure. So let us respond to the preaching of God's Word as we sing hymn number 591, Jesus Calls Us, verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. Would you please stand to sing? Father, we know that 
as we've just read, Lord, that whatever we've given to you, we've already received back thousands times fold. That whatever we give in this life is minute in comparison to what you have given before we've offered you anything. And yet, we have eternal life to look forward to. And so, Father, may we truly have that sort of reckless abandon that would say, whatever I have, I count cheaply, even as we give of our gifts in the offering. What a blessing it is to have that routine work, Lord, flimsy though it is, that reminds us that we have a greater treasure in you than we have in the riches of this world. Thank you, Father, for the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.